Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morsi. Uh, uh, my name is Tala Dalit Shahi. I'm a UN correspondent. Uh, I'm speaking to you as an Iranian. Uh, my country, uh, there was a lot of fervor uh, around an Islamic revolution, and women had a lot of interest in their rights. Um, that was taken away from them, and um, that was under Sharia law. How do you um, state that this is not going to turn into an Iran? How do you come to this conclusion? Because I find that a bit surprising. Yeah, th thank you. Um, and and uh, you know, I realize that you know, there's probably a lot more uh, data that I should uh, show to come to this conclusion. Um, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, I think that what, what was shown here is that the popularity of the Muslim Brotherhood, and we've seen it in elections, is not at the level that the popularity of the clerics in Iran was, right? So the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't occupy the analogous position in Egypt to the clerics in Iran. They can't uh, impose uh, willy-nilly what, what they might want to. I would also argue that the, you know, we, we should also you know, disaggregate Islamists a little bit, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, I would even argue, is maybe more, uh, less um, imperialistic on the issue of women than, say, maybe the Salafis are. I think they both have views that we would consider retrograde, but they differ uh, to a significant extent. The Muslim Brotherhood, for example, one of the most powerful bases of the Muslim Brotherhood support is the women's auxiliary. Um, and so the Muslim Brothers have done a lot of uh, sort of intellectual labor to try to make the argument that uh, women, for example, should be allowed to work in the workplace, uh, et cetera. And so the, the, vision for, uh, the vision for the role of women that they have is certainly not one that we would endorse, but it's not equivalent to what uh, uh, maybe the, the, the uh, mullahs in Iran wanted. Um, but more than that, it's not what the Egyptians want, right? And so if we can preserve democratic procedures in that country, I think that this issue of, of, of women, for example, if the Muslim Brotherhood came tomorrow and said, we've got to, all women have to wear the chador, all women have to wear the hijab, I think there would be a powerful constituent in, in Egypt that would, would say no. Um, and so that's, and, and, and so a little bit more evidence of this is if you look at the Salafist party in Egypt, okay, which is the much more conservative party, when they established their political party, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of people made the argument that you're making, that you people are retrograde, you're like the Taliban, and you want to impose that on Egypt. And so even the Salafists took great pains to take all that stuff out of their party platform in order to be more attractive to voters. So though I think that Egyptians in general want the Sharia, they want Islam, okay, I don't think they want a version of Islam or a version of Sharia that would force them to live in a very different way from the way they're living now, in which women are in the workforce, women are participants in public life, maybe not at the level we'd want them to be, but certainly not uh, the nightmare scenario you're describing. Richard Kossoff, an interested party. Uh, number three, keeping the army out of politics. The army has always been a force in Egypt. What is Morsi doing? What's his strategy against the army? Um, I think Morsi's strategy against the army is probably the smartest strategy, uh, uh, which is basically to give them everything they want. Okay, so. In, 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 in a new democracy like Egypt, uh, particularly where the, democ the uh, military controls, uh, I wouldn't say controls, you know, you often hear people say that the military controls 40% of the Egyptian economy. I find that impossible to believe. I've tried to gather numbers on this and I've never come close to 40%. But they certainly have significant land holdings in Egypt, particularly on the coasts and on bo in border areas. They are, they are certainly an interested party when it comes to the economy. And so what has Mohamed Morsi said? All of your prerogatives you can maintain. The new Egyptian constitution gives the military basically complete independence from civilian oversight. There is a body that is supposed to, you know, the, the body that is charged with oversight of the military is made up mostly of military people. It's stipulated in the constitution. 
And so I think Morsi's ta strategy has been basically to give the military everything they want. In, uh, in July or August of, of 2012, Morsi actually uh, um, you know, uh, was able to uh, you know, send into retirement the Minister of Defense and the Army Chief of Staff, and people looked at this as a, a Morsi kind of breaking the back of the military, whereas I see it as the consummation of the deal that the chief of staff and the minister of defense really were quite tired. They were quite tired of the military being blamed for governance. If they could come to this deal where the military wouldn't be prosecuted, the leaders wouldn't be prosecuted, rather, and the military could maintain its economic prerogatives and independence, then wh why do they need to be in power? Or why do they need to be uh, in front of the curtain? And so, But I think that's fine. Um, I think it's the only realistic thing, and even if it wasn't uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and it was some other group, I would have given them the same advice. Do that. Get the make the military feel secure so that you can actually go about this much more difficult task of developing and building democratic institutions, having turnover of power, etc. And then down the line, you can hold the military accountable, which is what's happening in Turkey now, which is what's happening in Indonesia. So, so I, I would argue that... Uh, that uh, taming the military is not the job number one right now. So am I to call on people or? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, oh okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Jeffrey Milton, uh, member of the FPA and past chief executive of the Law 43 Joint Venture Bank from 79 to 83 in Cairo. Um, given all that you've said, why is it the opposition continue to state that they want to boycott elections rather than participate in the electoral process? Yeah, this is, this is a, a, a very good question, and it's one that um, is frustrating. Well, the first thing, of course, is that uh, there, there are no, not going to be elections. At least as of now, uh, the electoral law that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, dominated uh, uh, legislature had come up with has been struck down by the courts and it's, being, uh, it's, it's going to be revisited by the Supreme Court. So we actually don't know when elections will be held. And part of the reason that the law was struck down hinges precisely on this, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's attempt to exclude uh, large numbers of people from running. Why does the opposition boycott because they don't think they can win, okay? Um, absolutely, they, they don't think they can win, and you might say, well, this is democracy. If you don't think you can win, then you know, do what you need to do in order to one day be capable of winning, but don't boycott, and certainly don't call for the military to intervene. Um, so look, there's this a lot of writing. You, you will find it almost impossible to read anything about the Egyptian opposition that does not refer to them as feckless, disorganized, stupid, etc. And I hate that, right? I think that these people are, on the contrary, committed, highly intelligent, highly creative people. But in this one area of boycotting elections, I think I'd have to agree. Uh, that really, if they, if they are ever to take the opposition from the street and make it into an instrument that can take power one day, right, and actually get us the alternation of power that is the hallmark of democracy, you've got to participate in elections early and often. Um, yes, sir. Which keeps it out of politics. Is that really yes. true? And with the oh. collapse of the police sector that we're reading about more and more, um, is it really a, a, a formula for keeping the army out of politics? And I'd like you also, if I may, to ask you to uh, talk a little bit about the Salafi party and uh, if the Muslim Brotherhood is, 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 is tanking in terms of pop popularity or eroding, um, will uh, the left <coughs> won't pick up all of the uh, losses? Do you want to bring points of view for the Salafi party? Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are great questions. So um, the first question, <clears throat> uh, I, 
I, I'm not sure how to answer it. So for me, let me just define my terms. So when I talk about the military staying out of politics, I mean the military not usurping authority and not kicking out democratically elected leaders as happened in Pakistan, for example. And so the fact that the government may need to rely on the military to restore order, to operate as a police force, that is untroubling to me. What troubles me is the prospect of the military actually taking power, of the military saying, we've tried this democratic experiment, it doesn't work, right? And unfortunately, we see many in the liberal opposition, people that I have a great deal of respect for, calling for precisely this. And I think that is a huge error. Um, uh, now, your, 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 uh, quest, your second question was about the Salafists, because as you detected in my remarks, um, I, I am assuming or I am hoping that as the Muslim Brotherhood's policy failures become ever more apparent to people, that people will shift and vote for the, uh, the main opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood, which isn't the Salafists, although they have been lately uh, 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 aligning themselves in opposition to, to uh, Morsi. Uh, but the real opposition is the National Salvation Front, these people in the street, non-Islamists. And so I've been assuming, hoping that the votes would flow to this, these groups if they ever ran in elections. Um, and you're uh, suggesting that, well, there are these powerful Salafists who have ties to voters. Uh, isn't it possible that votes will flow to them? And I think it is highly possible. The only... The only uh, bright spot, perhaps, that I can see is that there is significant fragmentation even now among the Salafists. So the Salafi party has basically fallen apart and become two different parties. There is another actor out there, a man named Hazm Salah Abu Ismail, who is a former Muslim brother and now a Salafist who almost ran in the uh, 2012 presidential election and was boycotted. He is, uh, is now entering the uh, uh, electoral arena anew. And so I could see actually a fragmentation of the Salafist, um, the Salafist bloc. More than that, and I don't have hard data on this, and there's some disagreement, but I think that the Salafists too have suffered uh, uh, in terms of public opinion. That there are all kinds of examples now that you have about uh, Salafist parliamentarians, you know, falling asleep on the job, or one Salafist parliamentarian uh, who claimed to have been beaten up, uh, and he showed up with, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, bandaged face, and it turned out that he had actually gotten a nose job, and uh, and this was a huge scandal in Egypt. Bilkim is the guy's name. So, uh, so I would suggest that politics uh, dirties everybody who participates in it, including uh, the Salafists, and so that might be uh, might be a, a reason for optimism. Yes, sir. You told that... Uh, I'm sorry, which institute? Uh, Peace Islands Institute. Peace Islands Institute? Oh, sure. The Fatullah Gulen... Uh, yeah, Inspired sure. Institute. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, you told that up, uh, up, uh, demonstrations by the oppositions or the people uh, in the street is good for democracy, for develop, development of democracy. and uh, But is it good uh, for economic development? So... Uh, is the cooperation between opposition and the government uh, uh, in economic policies uh, would be better for development? Yeah, it's certainly not better for economic development. It's certainly not going to bring tourists back to Egypt. Um, um, it's, it, you're, you're absolutely right on that. And so the question is really, how do we prioritize these things? And um, if, if, if economic uh, difficulty redounds to the benefit of the liberal opposition because it gives the liberal opposition a policy failure that they can point to, then I think it might be good. Um, in other words, uh, you know, many people, uh, particularly in Washington, will say we can't allow Egypt to fail, we can't allow the Egyptian economy to collapse, we can't, we can't. Um, my question is why not allow the Muslim Brotherhood government to fail, just like we allow any other government to fail? This may be a very important uh, thing that needs to happen in order for Egyptians to, to begin to assess the worth of the people that they elect into office. Uh, I have, yeah, we have so, time for two more questions. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll take them both, and I'll, I'll take one from here and then one from the back. So, and, so why don't you go ahead and then... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Hilary Cecil Jordan, I'm a member of the FPA. Uh, two, well, one question. 
Um, first of all, how much influence you say that Kerry would like consensus and is essentially going down the wrong path, how much influence does Kerry and do we have? And second of all, I would think that the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't have much of an appetite for foreign policy, but will it get drawn in, well, but maybe the economy would be more important now, but is it going to get drawn into Israel and what is its feelings towards Israel and do, does the Muslim Brotherhood uh, reflect the feelings of the Egyptians actually towards Israel? Thank you. Um, and then wh why don't we take that question as well and I will a answer them both. Sure. Uh, my name is Ian Greberans. Uh, thank you for coming to speak with us. Um, the question I have for you is you've posited that this w a leftist opposition is somehow a much better alternative. I guess what is the rationale for that? I mean, we saw in the 60s and 70s in the Arab world with um, Assad and Nasser, and none of those were particularly that much better than the Islamists. In fact, at the time, I think some people thought the Islamists would be better than uh, the Nasserite uh, form of government. That's great. Thank you. Those are both two great questions. I'll take the last one and then yours. Um, what I care about in Egypt is pluralism, okay? Getting competition among different political parties, and I, I'm kind of agnostic about where this comes from, okay? I don't really care. I just feel very strongly, and we know from history, that when you have one party or one ideological trend that dominates, that this is not healthy for a democracy. So even if it is leftist, right, uh, they are still nonetheless secular, okay, and that introduces a viewpoint into the Egyptian political space that I think is absolutely important. You're right, however, and this gets to your question, that on a lot of issues, they um, would agree, and those would happen to be issues that might be inimical to U.S. interests, particularly the issue of Israel, um, which I think uh, you know the Muslim Brotherhood and leftists and secularists outdo each other in order to show how much they hate Israel, and that seems to me to be in line with Egyptian public opinion. But if I were to characterize Egyptian public opinion, it would be we will resist Israel until the last Palestinian. In other words, that there is not a tremendous appetite for Egypt to actually find itself in a conflict uh, with uh, the Israelis. Um, uh, there may be reasons that that conflict would happen um, uh, for, for, um, for, for you know, no fault of either party. I could see a scenario in which the Israelis felt they needed to act against some threat in the Sinai that the government had not, the Egyptian government had not been able to tame and things escalate out of control. But I don't think the Egyptian government would take any active steps, whether it be Muslim Brotherhood or leftist, take any active steps to um, antagonize uh, the Israelis. Um, I think your other question about how much influence does the US have I don't know that we have a lot of influence except with this last group, the army. I think we have a tremendous amount of influence with them, and that's why my policy prescription is pretty modest, which is, you know, let's, uh, let's embrace the instability, let's understand what this is, which is kind of democratic opposition working itself out, and let's do our best to make sure that there is space for it, which means keeping the, the military from intervening in politics. So thank you all for your questions, it was really great.